Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthea Hancox from the Scanlon Foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's Lunch and Learn session with Fast Ed Hamogi and Dr. Sonia Hood. Before I introduce our two special guests, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all meeting today. In my case here in Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal elders who may be present here today. And if you're joining us from elsewhere in Australia today, please feel free to share the name of the lands you're meeting on through the chat function. This afternoon's lunch session will be similar to a fireside chat where both Ed and Sonia will be asking each other questions relating to food, culture and inclusion. Both speakers will share tips on building meaningful connections, not only at work, but within our communities. We hope that you will enjoy today's conversation and that it may provide some thoughts or ideas that may be of interest in both personal and professional settings. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our guests. Fast Ed Hamalgi, or Ed, <laughs> is one of Australia's best loved TV chefs and food authors. For over a decade, Ed has appeared on television and radio, in newspapers, magazines, and books. Ed made the decision to leave law school to pursue a career in cooking and never looked back. He now has more than 20 years experience cooking in some of the world's best restaurants, both in Australia and overseas and is also a very accomplished photographer. Thank you very much for joining us, Ed. In conversation with Ed today is Dr. Sonia Hood. Sonia is the chair of the Macaulay Community Services for Women, a director of the North Melbourne Football Club, and in particular, the CEO of Community Hubs Australia, where she leads a national partnership with schools, government, corporates, and philanthropy to engage isolated women and preschool children through, through place-based hubs in primary schools across Australia. Sonia has more than 20 years of social policy and program experience in the US, UK and Australia across the government, health and not-for-profit sectors. We appreciate you being here, Sonia. I know we're all excited to hear from our speakers today, but just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Today's session is being recorded and will be available via the A Taste of Harmony website in the coming days, in case you want to refer back to it or share the link with your colleagues. At any time throughout today's session, you'll be able to submit your own questions for Ed and Sonia, and to do so, simply type your question into the Q&A function at the bottom of the control panel. You can also like any questions within the Q&A panel that particularly interest you in order to vote them up the list. And Ed and Sonia will get to some of those questions later in the, their discussion. And finally, for those of you wanting to take this conversation online via social media today, I encourage you to use the campaign hashtag ATOH21. Okay, I think we're ready to get this conversation underway. I'd like to throw it over to you, Ed, to ask the first question to Sonia. Enjoy the conversation, everyone. All righty, here we go. Oh, I looked like a very beautiful flower there for just a moment. I thought that was magnificent. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, Sonia, I gotta, I gotta say, as someone who has a very odd, oddly spelled last name, um, I do notice that you're a Sonia with a J rather than the more um, traditionally Anglo version, which would be with a Y. Now, which part of the world is that little Jay coming from? Well, see, I'd like to tell you it's got a family heritage, but it doesn't. I think my mum was reading Tolstoy when I was born, and I think the translation she was reading spelled it with a J, and that was mine. And so I did have one of, I, in fact, I've spent my whole life respelling my name for people, um, and except for the uh, six months that I lived in Germany as an exchange student when I was 15, when suddenly my name was so normal. It was the, the one time in my life I've had a, a normal name. But you must have had to spell your surname for everybody all your life. I'll tell you something really funny. Yes. Uh, look, when you're Hungarian and you've got that G-Y thing going at the end of the surname, it's constantly, uh, you, you need to know how to pace it when you're spelling it out. So it's H-A-L, break, 
M-A-G break Y-I. Because if you put the G and the Y together in a phrase, people are like, oh, don't get it. But the funniest thing is I literally talk for a living and the number of times people say, I'm checking in someone and say, well, what's your name? I say, Ed. And they'll go, Adam? So, no, no, Ed. Oh, Ian? No, E-D. Oh, Eddie. I'm like, how, how did we get here? <laughs> yeah, I, I I used to get, so either they spell it wrong or they just replace it with something like Sophie. And I'll say, how do you get to Sophie? Like, it's not even similar. No, I, I, by that point, I'd be like, yeah, I'm happily Sophie. It's all good, yeah. But the Hungarian, yeah. yes, is interesting, especially here in Australia, because, um, you know, we did get a, a little bit of Hungarian migration to Australia in the 1930s. And again, of course, after the revolution in 56, but it's not a huge community here in Australia. Um, in terms of overseas expatriate Hungarian communities, it's really Australia and the United States, uh, a little bit of Canada, um, but there's not, it's not something you run into all the time. So my Hungarian food growing up was definitely left the field. Um, Hungarian goulash was one of my mother's signature dishes when I was a kid, and it was explicitly Hungarian goulash. And I, to this day, don't know whether it is Hungarian goulash, but it was. And there's a there's a, a pot that I can remember her making it in. I can never remember anything else happening in that particular dish except for Hungarian goulash. Well, well, this is good. This is good. Um, uh, it could well have been authentic Hungarian guyash. It, by the way, um, in Hungarian, it's G-U-L-Y-A-S, guyash, and that actually means um, cow herder. So it's like a, it's like a farm. It's, it means food for the farmer. Um, oh. But um, there are different versions all over Hungary. So if you head up north, it's quite watery and soupy, and if you head down south, it's really soupy and stodgy. Um, so you can actually say that it's authentic no matter what you make. That's the beauty of it. Nobody knows. So Gosh. Well, it was in that case. And I always heard it with a capital H, capital G too. It was yeah. titled. Not many of our meals were titled, but that one was. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we, yeah. we obviously were lucky because um, when we were growing up, we, we didn't really have sort of um, I didn't grow up in, in, a, in a home that had a food culture as such. I mean, there was the occasional Hungarian meal that would come through. But other than that, it really was more like um, just bang together. I, I, people ask me why I started cooking. I really, I think it partly was a, a matter of survival. So, um, so nice. tell, me about your, tell me about your background because that you, you have a really interesting backstory. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So my going forward, then back, then forward again, um, uh, my family came to Australia in 58 uh, after spending two years in a refugee camp in Wales. Um, there was a revolution in Hungary in 56 where they tried to overthrow the communist government. It was very unsuccessful. Um, and after Wales, I came to Australia. Both of my grandparents on my father's side were... Uh, doctors and ended up doing quite well for themselves. Um, on my mother's side, they were Russian Jews who had gone from Russia to France to the UK to Australia. But the Hungarian part, um, you know, they, they, they were all Hungarian Jews um, and really the ones that came to Australia other than my great aunt uh, in Budapest are the only ones who had survived 1944. Mm -hmm. So of a very large extended family, over 200 people, um, there were three survivors, four survivors, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, that was it. So uh, I guess it, to that end, I really, I savour and celebrate my Hungarian heritage because um, unlike my older sister and younger brother who they're aware of it, but it doesn't really matter to them. I am literally the last person in my family line who loves being an Australian Hungarian or Hungarian Australian, whichever you, way you want to put it. Um, provided that there's Cherishenia Gomboc, which is cherry dumplings, uh, on the menu some time of the year, I'm happy, you know. It's, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, the way, um, the way food or, or ingredients or recipes come with us and, and you know, and come with families and, uh, and either get changed when they're here or become even more traditional than perhaps they were before? Oh, totally, particularly the Jewish cooking. Oh, my Lord. Uh, Jewish food in the diaspora is so much more incredibly attention to detail Jewish. You go back to Israel and it's, like, it's actually, it's quite Sephardic, it's quite Mediterranean, whereas people in Australia take Jewish food in that very Ashkenazi kind of sense, which I like, but I mean, I've, I've got other things I like more, but um, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But I, I guess for you, it must have, I mean, 
I thought the whole Sonia thing was going to, you're about to tell me you had Croatian family and I was going to say, we're neighbours. But if not, I reckon the interesting bit for you is that if you're not coming from a sort of what you'd call a, a pan-cultural background, tell me about being involved with the North Melbourne Football Club. I'm a mad Sydney Swans fan. Like, but for you cut me, I bleed one red, one blue. Um, one red, one white. Sorry, I'm about to say blue and white for North Melbourne. Um, uh, it, that is an incredibly diverse community uh, up there. That, what's that like for you? Um, really diverse. And actually one of the things I love most about the club is the way in which, uh, and it's one of the things I love most about football is the way in which people come together from all kinds of different backgrounds and walks of life and, um, and experiences. And yet for, you know, any given three-hour period on a, what used to be a Saturday afternoon, but now any time between Thursday night and Monday night, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're just tribally connected. Uh, and then, you know, the thing ends and they all disappear off into their, into their ways. And uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic experience. And the, the kinds of different backgrounds of people and the ways in which people come to become a club supporter um, they, they are so varied and those stories are wonderful. Well, it's interesting. Are you Sydney because you were South Melbourne or are you Sydney because you're Sydney? Uh, I don't know. I'm, well, Sydney because I'm Sydney, but also Sydney because as a very young bloke, uh, a friend of mine asked me to come and play for uh, the Willoughby Wolves uh, at um, St Leonard's. And I was literally just as a fill-in player and I fell in love with the game. It was, it's just the most incredible game. And as for anyone listening who, who watches the AFL will know that um, there is no better spectator sport in the world because of the way it moves around the field. I'm all for you know, the league and, and union type sports, but that, that lockdown play is a lot, it's good to watch on telly, but to go and watch at the, at the ground is a lot more difficult. Our game, the AFL, there is nothing quite like it. It's extraordinary. I mean, really just breathtakingly good. But I, I wanted to know, you, your, your answer immediately went to the supporter base. And I love that. That is brilliant. True mark of a director of the club. Very good. Um, but I was thinking, of course, about your player base. And, and you know, for me, I... Um, I mean, we had until this year, obviously, Alir Alir playing for us from Sudan. Yeah. Magic Door has to be possibly the, one of the biggest superstars in the whole league. Um, you know, you, you... So, unfortunately, Magic, so Magic left us at the end of last year, which is I, I, part of ways of Magic. I know, but it wasn't amazing when he was with the club. What he did in terms of bonding, was it amazing? Yeah, amazing. And and actually, just I think being part of his journey was extraordinary. And, and the thing about... Um, there'll be plenty of other um, players from African backgrounds playing AFL and there'll be plenty of, there are plenty of people with a refugee background playing AFL and all of the rest of it. But in many ways, he was the first and watching him on his journey was an absolute privilege and watching him navigate um, this new sport in this new country uh, in a new way um, and, you know, just learn was, was an absolute privilege. So yeah, terrific fella, really terrific fella. I guess the point I'm trying to drill down to, um, asking you, uh, with your management hat on, you see somebody in this iconic role really performing that iconic duty, um, providing inspiration and direction to others and doing it with such grace, such incredible grace. It must be very inspiring for you and it must really, I guess, I would hope motivate you and other directors around the country to want more of that for the game and for our community generally. You know, um, one of the greatest things I've been involved in in footy was the first night that the um, the first night that the AFLW team trained at Arden Street, and the reason it was great wasn't because I, mean, I love all kinds of footy, men's and women. So that's not the, that's not the issue. What was great about it was that a bunch of kids had come down from the Housing Commission flats, which I'm probably not allowed to call Housing Commission flats anymore, but that's what they were when I was a kid. Mm. And they'd come down from the flats to watch training because one of the women playing was, it was their teacher. Um, and there were kids from Ooh. every conceivable background, boys and girls, every skin colour, every religion, all watching this training session because it was their local footy training. And I really loved that. I thought, you know, their version of what role models will look like will be really different than what I grew up with or what you grew up with. Yeah. Um, and that's a fantastic, that's a really great kind of social, you know, step forward. See, what you've described there is exactly what I, I love about what football can be. 
But I guess for you and for me and for other people who run businesses, what we're trying to do is to capture, to bottle, to disseminate that feeling, that moment, that idea through other parts of business. Now, for, for me, it's kind of a, we have limited opportunities to do it because we work in very, very small teams. But you've worked in some really big teams. Can you talk a little bit about how inclusion and diversity works there? Because that's, that hasn't been my background and I'd love to know more about it. So with hubs, uh, so I run a national network of community hubs around Australia at the moment, and we've got 90 of them in schools um, from as far north as Townsville, uh, right down through uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and into South Australia. And the hubs sit in schools that are really diverse. So we've got 90 hub leaders across the country um, based in primary schools um, and then a, a, another dozen or so people that work with them around the country. Um, and so that's a really diverse team, a really diverse team, very different, mostly women, all women, I think now, um, but from really different backgrounds and different levels of education and, and they come together in different ways. Um, and they work in schools <coughs> with uh, women from generally from non-English speaking backgrounds, although anyone can come to a hub um, and preschool children. And it's all about connection. It's all about bringing people together and bringing people in. Uh, and the thing that works universally across the board, actually, is people asking other people. It's having a cup of tea together. It's sharing a meal together. It's sharing an activity together, doing something together that we enjoy and getting to know one another. And I think there's something really universal about the need and interest in connecting, which I think actually um, is what food's all about for you, isn't it? Or do you cook oh, just for you? Oh, you no, know, absolutely. I mean, people always say to me, uh, um, what, what's life like working in the food business? And I'm like, well, I don't know because I don't work in the food business. I work in the hospitality business. It's a very different attitude, a very different mentality around what it is to serve food. And if you start off with the idea that the single most important thing we do with food is to share it with others and engage with them as a result, then from there, the idea that you would want to discover more about other people, their culture, their background, their way of seeing the world flows fairly naturally. But, you know, I think you're right. The greatest, the greatest lubricant for those conversations is a cup of tea and something sweet. You know, um, you know, as a pastry chef, I can tell you, you make a lot more friends cooking people what they want to eat than what they have to eat. So, um, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's really interesting. Um, you know, we've we've got women in hubs who swap recipes. They teach each other. Uh, recipes. I was in a hub in Western Sydney one afternoon when a Lebanese woman said to an Indian woman, your butter chicken is the only thing my son will eat, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I think there's something, there's also something really universal about kids being really picky when it comes to food. So, um, but, yeah, you know, picky but also in different not ways. necessarily being picky for the thing that's from where their family is from. I mean, I love that. What I love about that story is you've got a picky kid. The only thing they want to eat is something that is not from their you know, their parental culture. That's really awesome, which you wouldn't yeah. find unless you were making those connections in the first place. I mean, it, I suppose it does help in Australia. And, and I think a lot of people, particularly my friends and colleagues overseas, really cannot get their head around the degree to which Australia is a multicultural country. Um, you know, I, I think if I'm, if I'm not wrong, what is it, 53% of Australians are either born overseas or have a parent born overseas. And I, that mum, number might be just off, but not by much. And, and that's, yeah. you know, by orders of magnitude more than anywhere else on the planet. Um, you know, that, that means if, if, if that's the journey we're taking as a society, I think it's really important that we are ensuring that the building blocks of culture and, and society around us are able to handle that. I mean, like for me in Sydney, my favourite thing to do on a Sunday afternoon is to hop on the bike or in the car and head out to Blacktown. You head up Main Street, Blacktown. There is this tiny little Ethiopian restaurant. It's literally a one-man show. The guy does everything on his own. And it's the most extraordinary thing. And I, I'll be the only, you know, tall white bloke in the place uh, because, you know, there'll be um, Egyptian Christian ministers having a feast with some parishioners and there's, you know, little, there's Ethiopian families and then there's, um, obviously, Sudanese families who've come along as well. And it's it's brilliant to think that, you know, you've got these things in Australia that, you know, even just a generation ago, you couldn't find, you know. And Melbourne, of course, is fantastic for it. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And do you find yourself stealing ingredients or recipes or ideas or what, what happens for you? 
Well, when you say stealing ingredients, maybe stealing the idea of ingredients. If I was actually stealing, that's what I meant. I didn't mean actually. You may have had a problem with the coppers. A hundred percent. I make no bones about it. Uh, my job is to help share ideas with people more widely. And that does mean trawling and fishing through the, the community of flavors that surrounds us. I don't think, I, I don't believe that any one of us own our recipes or our ideas. I think the moment you have an idea and, and publish it, it's intended to be shared and made more public. You know, um, that to me is, is a, a really key building block of why food's important. Yeah. And which I think someone's asked this on the chat, actually. Mm. I'm now working out how to use that. What oh, is your favourite cuisine? <laughs> Mine. Well, I think yeah. you asked it too. My favourite cuisine. Uh, well, look, to cook, uh, the thing I love more than anything else is bread. And the reason for that is that um, uh, when you make bread, you find out a lot about yourself. You start with flour, water, salt and yeast. Nothing very valuable. To create something extraordinary, you need to bring skill to the table. Bread is a measure of the skill of the baker. But to eat, I've got to tell you, if it's soupy and noodly and got some veggies, I don't care if it's fur or if it's Cambodian noodle soup or whatever, I'm I'm definitely happy. So, um, yeah. With, with or without chili oil? Oh, bring on the chili oil. Come on. It makes many things better. <laughs> what do we want to hear for you? Now, Sonia, would you know any practical ways that you can continue to promote diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Now, this has come from Anonymous. So that person uh, is obviously very scared of your response, but that's okay because she's very lovely, Sonia. Um, as a AFL director, I reckon I am diversity. So there's a start. No, I, um, I think if we just start to think about people and what they can do rather than how they present that's a good starting point isn't it and think about getting different ways of looking at the world and different ideas in it's a bit like cooking you know you add yeah. in ingredients from somewhere else and suddenly it's a heck of a lot more interesting um, there are Absolutely. lots of different ways of thinking and solving problems yeah I, I think that's a really good point one of the barometers of that that I've always sort of leaned on um, is the really it's very sad but we have very few young men who choose to go into primary education in Australia. Now, that's not the case overseas. And, you know, it would be really fantastic if we had more, more male teachers um, working in our public school system, particularly, look, not only, but particularly as role models for, for young men when they're, when they're first starting to grow up. Um, and I think there's an example of if we viewed teaching differently, then more young men might say, you know what? Yeah, it is for me. So I think the point you're making is right. If we as a community just frame these discussions differently, maybe we get a different result. And that's how you promote diversity in everything. It's that mirror test, isn't it? If I look across and see that everybody over there doesn't look like me, maybe I'm not that interested in going to join them. And, and you know, if young boy, you're right, if boys look up and see that all the teachers are women, well, maybe they think that's not, you know, not for them. <laughs> 100%. I mean, look, you know, the number of discussions have been had over the course of the last five, six months uh, about the difference that, you know, not here in Australia, but overseas, finally having a, a female uh, woman of uh, black and South Asian heritage, you know, sitting in the vice presidential chair in the United States, the different that representation, the difference that makes and from there, it makes a difference worldwide. And I'm hoping that more young women are sort of saying to themselves, you know what, that is for me. I do belong in that discussion. I do belong in that place, you know. Um, you know, actually, there's another interesting question here, which I, I guess I haven't had to think about. Um, the whole COVID thing um, didn't affect uh, us the same way because in media we were considered to be uh, um, somehow an essential industry. Don't ask me how that got, got, got concluded, but it did. Um, so we weren't as separated as others. Did you find the idea of maintaining those those philosophies of um, uh, diversity more difficult during COVID? I mean, how did you, in your various jobs, how did you find that? Um, it was really interesting, wasn't it? I think as long as you could do this, like as long as you could operate a screen and an internet connection, and in fact, as long as you had a screen and access to an internet connection, then there was some degree of connection, um, you, you, you know, like this. But um, I found, I don't know what everybody else thought, but I found doing online cooking groups and that sort of thing just left me cold. I really struggled with that. Um, I did do an awful lot more local takeaway 
um, to keep yeah. my local restaurants. You know, I felt like I was a one woman crusader for keeping my local restaurant industry alive. Um, but I, I think the connection was really difficult. And I do think you you don't realise how, how valuable human connection is until you, you lose it. Sonia, you again, so for... right. There are some things that work really well digitally and other things just, they're a lost cause. And I'm with you on that idea of, of the uh, the cooking lessons just not, they don't work. I'm sorry, they're just, they're so impersonal. Uh, I mean, I've obviously done a lot of them. Um, that said, the afternoon quarantinis, uh, I've got to say, some of my wife and some of her friends did enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, look, it was an all downside. Um, so I think, you know, I think the, the first thing we did when we came out of, um, you know, lockdown was to find people to go and eat with, you know, the the, the breaking bread together um, is, you know, to go back to your favourite thing to cook, the breaking bread together is, is, is part of what binds us, I think, as yeah. people. Ed, someone's raised this, and it is something you said earlier about learning to cook for survival. What did you mean? Uh, well, okay, so, so my dad was a professor of neurology at uh, Sydney University and Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Uh, my mother was professor of, chemi of um, computer science um, at Sydney and then Macquarie. And so, you know, you had a couple of people who were very talented but worked incredibly long hours. And sort of from about the age of 10, um, it wasn't uncommon that, you know, both parents would be working late. And, you know, I, I think these days, if you told that story, someone would call docs. But um, in the mid 80s, it was like, well, you better start cooking something. And so it was literally, if you want to eat this food in the fridge, you better learn how to do something. You know, to my credit, I never burnt down the house. And, you know, I've ma managed to make a career of it. Um, I, I guess... In those very, very early days, what I learned is that you don't have to do something complicated in order to make people happy. And that is a guiding ethic that really um, abides with me even now. Um, the, the work I do in media is very much about ensuring that simple but delicious things are made convenient and accessible. Uh, we, I do a lot of complicated cooking in my own right, but I don't need to do it on telly. Um, I think the other thing... Do you, I, do you prefer to complicated cook? Are you a, do you get a degree of enjoyment out of that um in a very very limited way if you want to talk about baking anything baking yeah yeah uh, it, uh, hit me hurt me i love it um <laughs> but uh for the rest of the stuff i guess i learned a principle working with an extraordinary italian chef many many years ago she taught me that uh, a, a phrase that i stole hook line and sinker which was um when you do less the ingredients can do more most of the people I know who cook, including most professional chefs, and I say this with love and respect for all of them, are incredibly arrogant people. Um, they really want to control the food. They, it's a, you know, a humans over nature, man over nature situation. But really great food comes when the humility of the chef comes to the fore and they can look at an ingredient and say, you're amazing as you are. My job is to take a step back and let you be the superstar. But most of the people in the kitchen, they want to be the superstar, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. Difficult. Yeah, I think that probably is tricky, um, uh, particularly when you are a superstar chef. Like, wouldn't you want everyone to know that? Uh, I, I think I did when I first started. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Particularly in the start of my, my media career when I was still working in restaurants pretty much full time. Um, and, you know, I was running a two chefs at restaurant and, there was a lot of pressure on me in my work life, a lot of pressure on me in my, my media life. Um, and then the thing I discovered is what I find most enjoyable myself is, is creating a concept, a recipe, an idea that, you know, I don't want to gender split this, but this is how I think about it in my head, that a mid-30s dad on a Sunday afternoon can make with his five-year-old. If I can do that... That's my job done. That, that really, that is the thing I want to be able to do. I want food to bind families together. I particularly want it to involve younger children. Um, and I really, I know how many men uh, either never cook or miss out on cooking for most of their life. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to rectify some of that. Um, so yeah, it is about simpler stuff and I make no bones about that. And sometimes I get, you know, the the slightly hostile emails saying, oh, God, it's so simple. Why do you, why do you embarrass yourself on television? It's like, buddy, if, if you think I'm embarrassed, 
you don't know me very well. <laughs> that's funny. There, I think that's a really good point around um, about both men cooking, but also about families cooking. I think it's a, when I think about the way I grew up, um, I, you know, I had a single mother who worked and so I was cooking from probably the age of 11 or 12. We started on the roasts because they were the hardest things to ruin, yeah. um, and which is, you know, it's just a lot of chopping really and then a bit of oven time and some prayer, you know, it's kind of more or less how I've always approached a roast. But, um, but it was a family thing. You know, we cooked together, we sat down and ate together, we didn't have a dishwasher so we cleaned up together. And then, the, you know, and on a Saturday, you go to the market together and the whole thing would start again. And I'm not oh, yeah. sure that families operate that way anymore. There's a lot more convenience in our what lives. What you just described is not overly different to how I myself was growing up, which is that it was in a different era. There was a different level of expectation. But, of course, you've raised a challenge there because you're describing yourself as something of an aficionado of food, fairly competent in the kitchen. I want to know, when you're in these meetings with the, the ladies at the hubs, and they're all talking about their fatouche and their machuba and all the bits and pieces. Sonia turns around and says, but you haven't tried my, and what do you suggest? Oh, How do so, you go off to genuinely good cooks? So I learned a long time ago, don't enter a fight that you've got no hope of winning, for starters, <laughs> because I bring nothing good to this table. But the challenge for me, Ed, is that um, is the 10 years ago I was diagnosed as a celiac. And the reason I'm telling you that I was diagnosed as a celiac is because I've always been intolerant of food intolerances. And so the universe delivered me a massive one as its way of saying yeah, there's a bit of karma for you. Um, and so I have, to, I have to go through these quite complicated conversations about explaining to people why I can't eat their food. And often when I'm going somewhere as the guest, you know, to a hub, you know, here's Sonia from Melbourne and she's in charge and she's coming to our hub and everybody cooks something because that's their way of welcoming me. And to go into somewhere where you're being welcomed by food and then say, well, I can't eat it. And to explain that to people <laughs> is really challenging. So I haven't thought about extending the conversation to, by the way, see that delicious thing that you made me that I can't eat. I, can I just tell you about something better? So that, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that would be hard. Yeah. <laughs> Not only do you smack down there cooking, you then want to one-up them. That would be a double up. Wouldn't yeah. It? But what I have discovered is that there are lots and lots of cuisines that are really perfect if you're a celiac. So, you know, there's lots and lots of cuisines that don't use gluten at all. Vietnamese. Vietnamese, Indian. You yeah. know, lots of the South American um, foods. There's yeah. lots and lots of ways of cooking without. Japanese um, food. There's virtually, I mean, there's occasionally a tiny bit of gluten, but um, that's really in quite modern. Yeah, this, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, you know, and I, I'm with you on that, that whole, you know, intolerant of intolerance. Um, but my, my thing is this, and I've got to ask you a very important question because it's relevant to my day to day. When you're heading off to an event and in your roles, you must go to a lot of events, I'm assuming that you let everybody know in advance, listen, by the way, I don't mean to be a bother, but uh, I'm gluten-free. I just want to check that's okay. Yes? Yes. Yeah, of course you do. And because you're, you're a wonderful, polite, generous human being. So to everybody who ever attends a dinner where I'm cooking, please don't tell me you're vegan three hours before we serve. Yeah, or just as we're sitting down. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And it's it's easy enough to navigate around, isn't it, once you know? You've just got to know. Yeah, absolutely. It's not that hard. You know, we just yeah. you need to know. And, and you know, it, it's like the cultural stuff. Like, I mean, you know, I I keep kosher, uh, you know, and I, for the most part, I can navigate that um, in life in the same way that, you know, when people people tell me they're halal or whatever, that, that's, it's, it's very easy, but you just need a, a little bit of warning about it, you know? You do. Is there anything aside, leaving the kosher question aside, is there anything that you could be served up and you'd look down and your heart would sink and you'd think, oh, I just don't want to eat this? Okay, there's only three things in the world I will never again eat. I don't care how much okay. I love you or how needy you are, I'm never putting it in my mouth. The first thing, I will never again eat silkworm pupae. Uh, that's the pre-larval stage of silkworm. Uh, it was an exotic foods market, uh, Western Shanghai. Uh, wow, broke my brain that trip. Um, secondly, pig's liver. Um, right. it, yeah, it just, it is the most stinky, ureic. It, it smells like an unclean bathroom. I mean, that's just, I, I can't. He's selling it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly right. No. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, do you have it on toast? What, what what do you do with it? Well, generally generally speaking, it's uh, it's just fried and then served on on rice. I mean, you, you get quite a lot of that sort of in in Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, yeah. Right. I, I okay, so no silkworm, no, no pig's liver. Pig's liver, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and, and the only other thing for me I will never again touch is bad pizza. You know, it, you know, a lot of people say you can't, you know, no pizza is bad pizza. I'm sorry, that's just not true. I've had enough. No, plenty of pizza bad. I'd rather go hungry than eat bad pizza, you know. And what makes the pizza bad? Generally, the, the, the dough is generally just, it's, it's more like a cake. It's like a thick, cakey slightly sweetened stodgy mass underneath and that's just no good for anyone it doesn't the world doesn't need to be like that uh, particularly not if you head uh, to a good website um, and uh, find yourself a great recipe for uh, pizza bases I mean you, you uh, there's some good chefs working online who you might be able to uh, I, I know I know one anyway so. <laughs> and where do you stand on the question of pineapple on a pizza so, I'm sorry you you're breaking up there <laughs> I, I can't hear you. Well, <laughs> my attitude to that is the same as my attitude to people wanting a well done steak. It's your pizza. It's your steak. I will happily do whatever you want. Just I wouldn't choose it for myself. You know, I, I, I get it. You know, people like it. Great. The, the, it's like I said, I'm not in the food business. I'm in the hospitality business. Hospitality is done when you've made other people happy. So, yeah. Mm. Um, and if someone's asked a question here. Are there cuisines that you haven't tried yet that you'd like to try? Or is there oh, stuff you... Oh, there's plenty I haven't tried. There is not a good Mongolian restaurant in, in Australia that I've found. And if someone knows one, find me on okay. social and, and bump me. I'd love to go and try a good Mongolian um, restaurant or even, you know, Kazakh, Tajik, Tajikistani, you know, the, the whole Central Asian cuisine. Um, I mean, that's where the Hungarian people originated we, on the eastern side of the of the Mongolian steppe, right through Kazakhstan. So I'd love to do that. Um, uh, I, I happen to love Iranian food. All the best Iranian food I've ever had uh, has always been in people's homes, not in. Uh, yeah. I haven't found a great Iranian restaurant. I'd love to find a good one. Um, yeah, you should come and visit some hubs, and we'll, you can meet some of the best Iranian cooks in Australia. I reckon. Well, but that's it. That's where they are. They're they're in home. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And look, what's the best thing you've learned in all your interactions with these incredible home cooks from the hubs? What what's what's the thing? The idea you've always thought to yourself that sounds like like absolute heaven on a plate. Uh, in food terms, yeah. I think it's turning up. I think it's when you turn up at lunchtime at a hub and someone's, you know, a group of mums have started, you know, got, got there at 8.30 or 9 and they're cooking a giant pot of vegetable rice something, you know, just yeah. one of those pots of, of indeterminate thing but they've been slow cooking for hours and everybody's had a turn and everybody's got a favourite ingredient and I think it's those and I think it's not just the fact that the food's so good. I think it's the, the conversation and the laughter and the fact that by the time you turn up, they've all had private jokes for, you know, they've gone from maybe not knowing each other to now being, you know, lifelong best friends because they've just had this shared experience. Um, I particularly like it when... The kitchens. You, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> is, that, that, is, it, is it really cool? And, and honestly, if you're listening at home or at work, that was amazing. You just said all these different cooks all got to have an opinion and add their own private favourite ingredient into the one pot. There would be knives at six paces in a commercial kitchen. Get away from my pot. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. I love well, it. My, my favourite bit is the ones that then package it up and sell it to the staff in the school. You know, they often start yeah. out by giving meals to teachers and by the end of the term they're selling them and I think there's something, you know, quite nice about that too, to yeah. be perfectly honest. No such thing as a free lunch. No, exactly right. You know, one thing I've always thought would be amazing would be for more school canteens to have um, uh, ethnically diverse food days um, on a regular basis throughout the course of the year. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, 10 days throughout the course of a year, you know, one day it might be, um, I don't know, make it interesting. It could be just Italian food, but it's not pizza and it's not pasta, you know. You know, yeah. introduce kids to polenta or whatever, something really basic. But then another day it could be Vietnamese or another day it could be Iranian or another day it could be, I don't know, Polish food. It would be a really interesting project to do. I think it could be complicated, but I reckon it, uh, it'd be something worth trying. What was in your school lunchbox? Can you remember? <laughs> yeah, this is my this is my Hungarian Jewish coming out. Uh, Vegemite sandwich. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever try anything Hungarian Jewish? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my grandmother was great for that. You know, she was very handy. No, but I mean in your lunchbox. Would you have taken it to school? Oh, oh no. I, I reckon I might have been sensitive around that. I reckon yeah. I might have been, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We've had a lot of people talk about that, you know, from our age, that you just wouldn't have taken anything foreign to school ever if you walk through a school playground now at lunchtime and look into kids lunch boxes it's it's the united nations of food in there like it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Total so again our yeah. our kind of tolerance of what's acceptable in that space has really shifted oh, but then again i was the master of swaps so i would just have like a a, a vegemite or peanut butter sandwich or whatever my best mate was afshin fahari he was um, he was from tehran um he would have just the most amazing like biryani or whatever. And I would totally trade lunches with him. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. 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 I always envied people with really good food traditions in their families. You know, yeah. we had the women's weekly cookbooks of the world cuisine, but it wasn't quite the same as having no, a no, you know, no. Hungarian Pineapple grandmother who could cook. Quite the same thing, is it? <laughs> no. So, so I think that's absolutely right. Um, so I, I don't know. I think if you, were, if you were putting food in your kids' lunchboxes now, what would you be putting? Uh, for me, um, I'm lucky. My, my daughter's just turned 18. She's off at uni doing international relations, which seems appropriate nice. in this context. Uh, the boy, I have failed parenting with my son. Uh, he is the most fussy, difficult, hard to feed young lad. Beautiful kid, but oh my Lord, he, ma he makes me ashamed of my career choice. So. It's not your failure as a parent. That's just quintessential rebellion. Had to rebel against something. Yeah, that's always. a fifteen-year-old boy as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah his, right. idea, his idea of cuisine is is a subway. I was like, oh, dude. Hey, that's a lot of lettuce in a subway. That's not that bad. Could be worse. <laughs> Wow, thank you, you two. This has been just a terrific conversation. I've got to say, Ed, I'm completely in agreement with you about uh, the pig's liver. I'm quite happy to give that a miss for the rest of my life. <laughs> nice one. But, uh, but absolutely delighted to have listened to this incredibly engaging conversation. Um, and I must say, going back to the beginning of the conversation, anybody who's serving cherry dumplings is on my list as well. Yeah. Uh, that sounded just spectacular. Um, both of you, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Plenty of ideas and thoughts from everybody. And, uh, and I'm really grateful uh, that we've had this opportunity I'm sure the audience has found it really interesting as well. Um, to our audience as well, uh, of course, um, thanks for taking time out of your day and spending your lunch break with us. Uh, we're in the final days of A Taste of Harmony for this year. But uh, for more great ideas on how you can celebrate diversity and inclusion in your workplace year round, head to tasteofharmony.org.au. And of course, we look forward to seeing you all again at A Taste of Harmony in 2022, next year. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Thanks.